In 2009, Valve released Left 4 Dead 2 onto the personal computer, and everyone loved it. But there was a problem. Japan at the time didn't really have a very large PC gaming user base. I mean, it does now, like everyone is on Steam. But back in the early 2010s, support for the platform amongst Japanese games and gamers was not nearly as widespread. But that was alright, because Left 4 Dead 2 was also on the Xbox 360... Mm, right, that's not going to work either. So, okay, 2009. Japan doesn't really play games on PC or Xbox. Thus, Valve, in partnership with Taito, hatched a cunning plan to bring their hit game to the wider Japanese audience, thus creating the subject of today's video. Left 4 Dead Seizon Shatachi, or Left 4 Dead Survivors. I mean, you looked at the title, didn't you? Teased to the public initially as Project Z via this trailer in February 2014. Man, I remember when people thought this was teasing some kind of Left 4 Dead 3, and boy were they disappointed. Left 4 Dead Seizon Shatachi is a Japanese exclusive arcade adaptation of Left 4 Dead, released later that year in December and was actively supported for a little under three years before ultimately being discontinued on July 26th, 2017, having its online support cut off. In 2019, the game files were dumped online, enabling players to run the arcade version on their own home computers with a bit of elbow grease. Now, I'm a Left 4 Dead super dork, and I find this port very interesting for a whole bunch of reasons, so I'm here to enumerate the many quirks of this port for you here today. So first, let's go over the actual machine itself. The first question in adapting Left 4 Dead to the arcade is the controller, because you can't just give people a keyboard in the arcade. So Saison Shatachi controls with a combination of what I'm sure is just a Razor Death Adder mouse and this wee nunchuck looking device. Mouse controls normal mouse type actions like looking around and shooting, while the nunchuck handles movement, jumping and crouching. The game runs on the Taito Type X3 arcade hardware, which if you don't know, and this might blow your mind if you haven't kept up with arcades over the past decade or so, is literally just a Windows 7 PC. This is one of the reasons that running the game on your own computer is relatively simple, because it literally is just a Windows application. Saison Shatachi is literally built on top of the existing Left 4 Dead 2, rather than being an entirely new game. So, actually booting the game up, we get to choose our character. Yes, Left 4 Dead Arcade ditches the usual stable of Left 4 Dead survivors in favour of four new characters. Haruka Hirose, a high schooler, Yusuke Kudo, a college student, Sara Kirishima, a Japanese-American tour guide, and finally the extremely fantastically named Blake Jordan, a bartender. He's my favourite. Of the four characters, three of the justifications for being inserted into Left 4 Dead's premise is just, they were on a school trip when the outbreak happened with Blake being the only person more specifically tied to a location, with his backstory being that he was the bartender of the hotel that the game starts in, in Dead Center. We are then prompted to exchange our money for SVP, or Survivor Points. Unlike what you might have expected, Saison Shatachi does not function on a lives type system where your credit is over when you die. SVP is essentially purchasing playtime. The rate shown on the screen is about 1 SVP per second, so for 1 credit, or 100 yen, you get about 4.5 minutes of playtime. On the top end, if you stick 5 credits in, you get about 26 and a half minutes of playtime. Towards the end of the game's lifespan, they were apparently running 2 times bonus campaigns as well, so if your timing was good, you could have gotten almost an hour's playtime off the local equivalent of 5 bucks, which is not half bad for an arcade cabinet. And getting in the main menu, as I said, the game was taken offline in 2017, so this represents the final offline build of the arcade machine. All campaigns are playable, including the Left 4 Dead 1 ones, even Crash Course, Cold Stream, and The Passing, but not The Last Stand because that released for the PC version in 2020, which was well after the arcade game had ended service. And all difficulties are selectable, and you can even match locally in the same store should the arcade you're playing happen to have multiple cabinets of this game linked together. When the game was online, you would have had the option to do countrywide matching, essentially playing the game online with other arcade patrons, not unlike the PC version. There was also clan matching, where you could create a clan and match with specific people in said clan. You know, not unlike a friends list. This is all perfectly sensible functionality, it's just funny to me how much Left 4 Dead Arcade is just dead ass a PC game. Like, all of the functionality that you would expect of a PC game is preserved here. This was all handled via the Nesaka service, which if you've never encountered this, is a kind of account system for arcade games in Japan, where you purchase a card that can be scanned onto the cabinet that you will then log into your account, and your play data, like unlocks or level, can be remembered. Almost all arcade games in Japan these days use a system like this. I actually have like a Konami branded one of these for Dance Dance Revolution and the like. While the game had active online support, if you didn't card in via Nesica, you were restricted to only being able to play Dead Center or Dark Carnival, and only on the easy difficulty. The others were unlocked by carding in and increasing your account's rank by playing the game. When the game was taken offline, it received a final offline content unlock patch, and that is the reason why all campaigns and difficulties are selectable here. It's not uncommon for arcade games in Japan to receive these kinds of final offline patches when their service is shut down. The final feature here is events, which were special game modes that ran for a limited time on a schedule, like the old mutation system before Valve simply enabled all of them by default. 
We'll get back to this and the Nessica service in general, because there's some interesting stuff regarding how these were integrated. One thing I find interesting about Arcade is that at launch it only contained the first five Left 4 Dead 2 campaigns. Dead Center, Dark Carnival, Swamp Fever, Hard Rain, and The Parish. The other campaigns were added in updates over the game's lifespan, like this blog post from the official website indicates that Dead Air wasn't added until April 2016, a little under two years after the arcade game was released. I remind you that by this point, all of the Left 4 Dead 1 content had been released for the original PC game in 2010, along with Cold Stream and The Passing and so on. And like, to be as clear as possible, Left 4 Dead 2 did release in Japan, the PC release supports Japanese UI text just fine, and Japanese gamers possess equal capacity to look things up on the internet. PC and Xbox gaming might not have been super popular in the region at the time, but like, Japanese gamers did know what Left 4 Dead was. So this decision to slow roll content that was at this point years old into an already dated release of a game that did come out there kind of bewilders me, but I don't claim to understand the economics of Japanese arcade game releases. So let's actually start playing the video game. I'm making the assumption that if you clicked on this video and got this far that you're generally familiar with how Left 4 Dead 2 works, so I'll abridge the basic explanation and say that Arcade plays absolutely identically on a basic mechanical level. Your goal is unchanged as ever, kill zombies, don't get got by specials, make it to the safe room alive. The first thing you're likely to notice is that the UI is completely different, with a progress meter and timer in the top left, and your player name all nice and big in the bottom left. In offline play, the name defaults to Nammo Naki Seizonsha, or Nameless Survivor. The space below is where your title would have gone, which would have been unlocked and kept on your Nessica profile based on achievements you unlock playing the game. Now, back to the timer. The timer might seem strange, since I already explained that SVP is a kind of timer, but this timer corresponds to the map, rather than your credits. If you run out the clock, the game will spawn in endless tanks to kill your team. This seems to have been more about preventing people from stalling the game on any one map for too long than limiting your playtime exactly. There's also a score counter. This doesn't really matter in offline play, but we'll get back to that. Now, second thing you're likely to notice is the violence level is censored, with no decapitations, dismemberment, or much gore at all, really. Zombies also simply disappear when they're killed. This is particularly funny when you get the explosive ammo, because then when you shoot a zombie, they just poof, gone, deleted from the game. The censorship level seems to match the German and Australian versions of the PC release, and in fact the arcade version uses the Australian-specific cricket bat texture, implying that the Aus version in particular was the base here. Because yeah, if you didn't know, the Australian version of Left 4 Dead 2 has a unique texture for the cricket bat. Relatedly, something unique to this version that I'm not completely sure whether to count this as censorship or not, but the Riot Cop infected in the Parish campaign are bright green now for some reason. I don't know if this is for readability, or if maybe they decided to hedge their bets on depictions of police murder for the arcades, I really couldn't say, but it felt worth a mention here. Also, to be clear, because I think people will get the wrong impression if I don't, the Japanese PC and Xbox releases of the game were not censored at all, and never have been. This violent censorship is unique to the arcade version in the region. Presumably this was done voluntarily, for public appearances and appeal, because I don't think the Japanese rating board even rates arcade games, so there's no legal obligation to do this, as far as I could tell anyway. Probably the biggest change in terms of raw mechanics is the fact that you can no longer friendly fire your teammates at all, regardless of difficulty. The characters react, and you lose score, but no damage will be dealt. I imagine this is to prevent any avenue for griefing rather than censorship, because it's one thing on PC when some jerk kills you and ruins you on the lobby. It's quite another when it happens in an arcade and said jerk has now actively cost you money. It does make the game easier though, especially on the higher difficulties. Something that also makes the game a lot easier is how death is handled in this version. If a player dies, they simply have to wait 15 seconds and they pop back to life near in a live player with the only penalty being spawning in with 50 health and only the basic pistol. This absolutely incentivizes tactical deaths as part of the game plan when you think you can get away with it. As long as everyone isn't dead at the same time, you can't lose. However, if everyone is incapped at the same time, that still triggers a mission failure which results in the game somewhat unceremoniously booting you back out to the main menu. You can simply choose to load back into the map you failed on and try again, of course, but it does mean that you can't get back any weapons or items that you brought in from a previously cleared map. Continuing the theme of things being a little easier, the level design is slightly altered, like obviously you have these arrows placed everywhere now to point players in the correct direction along with the objective more directly flashing across the screen every so often. But the levels themselves have actually been edited to simplify the more open areas. Covering every minor change would take literally ages and make this video very boring, but a good microcosm is shown on the very first map here in Dead Center. There's extra carts here blocking this window out onto the balcony, and a newly placed sofa preventing you from proceeding forward on said balcony too far, corralling players back inside the building. While there seems to have been an effort to simplify the level design, it's still Left 4 Dead 2 and Taito is not strong enough to stop the Saw Spaghetti Monster, so things like this skip straight into the elevator in the first map of Dead Center and the Dark Carnival Finale Godspot absolutely still work. There don't seem to be any particular bug fixes compared to the retail release otherwise. 
And in some cases, the edits to the geometry are kind of sloppy. Here's a clip of me getting immediately incapacitated at the start of Dark Carnival 4, I think because some of the newly placed props intersect the player spawn. Cool. So while the level design got simplified, one thing that got massively expanded was the weapon roster. Like, massively. I literally cannot cover all the weapons that got added because it was make this video, like, actually twice as long. But there's a ton of new guns added. Some of them are, like, doofy things like the Red Magnum. It's the Magnum, but red. <laughs> but there's so many other weapons that mostly feel like existing weapons, but with remixed properties. Like this rifle that feels like the Tier 2 Sniper, but you can fire it as fast as you can press Mouse 1, which is absolutely as broken as it sounds. Or this gun, which feels like a tier 1 shotgun, but you can rapid fire it. Again, as fast as you can press M1. But this is mainly good for draining your 56 ammo reserve extremely quickly. Or this sniper rifle, which has an extremely slow firing rate. It's the regular sniper rifle, but slow. And bad. Look, I'm not much of a gun person, so I couldn't tell you what these guns, like, are. Just their gameplay functions. There's like over 20 new weapons added that all spawn in over normal gameplay, and in lieu of explaining everyone individually, I just made an effort to use arcade-specific weapons as often as possible in the background footage, even though some of them are kind of bad. Despite all the new guns, though, none of the Counter-Strike weapons spawn in the arcade version. There's also new melee weapons, but none of them spawn in natural gameplay for some reason. They seem to be skins rather than new weapon types, which would mean they'd be unlocked via the Nessica profile system but they can still be spawned in via console commands. My favourite of these is this giant sword that is so big it looks kind of... wrong in third-person view. This isn't modified, the game just looks like this. Now instead of talking about what was added or subtracted, let's focus on something that's more... natural. I've kind of buried the lead on this because I'm not completely sure how to convey this, but the entire game has been rewritten and redubbed into Japanese for these new survivors. And I don't just mean generic barks and gameplay-related shouts, I mean all of the character and world-building-related lines have been given a makeover for this new cast. Hey, hey, hey! Jimmy Gibson Jr. I'm a Maybe you remember how in Dead Center the survivors use uncertain nicknames for the special infected before eventually settling on the names we're all familiar with. Well, the arcade version invented new, specific equivalent nickname lines that similarly only play in Dead Center, like how Blake calls a smoker a Pero Pero Yatsu, loosely meaning licking dude. In general, the survivors banter, exchange personal stories, and generally act as you would expect Left 4 Dead characters to act. I found all of this very impressive because it's a lot of material to rewrite and dub, although I don't think they recorded quite as many line variants as the base game from my observations of a couple goes through. Even the bit parts like Virgil and the Cola guy are voiced in Japanese here. But more interestingly still, in Left 4 Dead 1 campaigns you still play as this new group of survivors even though there is now even less plot justification for this. But when you play the passing campaign in particular, the Left 4 Dead 1 survivors are still there on the bridge and they're dubbed in Japanese too. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, they exchange witticisms with the new group, and there's even a good few line variants. It's just very surreal to hear these characters voiced in Japanese, because neither Left 4 Dead 1 or 2 had Japanese audio. In their PC and console releases, it was just English with subtitles. I also could not find a single source on who voices these iconic characters in this iteration of the game. Neither the player ran wiki nor the official material had any leads on that. A shame, because I'd love to know. As an aside, for some reason during the passing finale, every single time I picked up a gas can, Zara just kept thanking Zoe over and over again. Kinda weird, but it made me laugh, so in it goes. Back to the voice acting talk. So what we have here is essentially an alternate universe story of Left 4 Dead 2, following mostly the same plotline, but the particulars of each character's relationship with the locations and the setting is naturally totally different, so it ends up being a weirdly fascinating take on the world of Left 4 Dead, and short of like literally subtitling an entire playthrough, I'm not sure how to get this across how fascinating I found this to people who don't speak Japanese. You just have to take my word for it, I thought it was cool. Albeit, something the subtitles give away is how this game is still just very much kind of an elaborate Left 4 Dead 2 mod, because the character subtitles still correlate to the colours of the normal Left 4 Dead 2 survivors. Haruka's subtitles are pink, like Rochelle, Sarah's a purple like Coach, Blake is yellow like Ellis, and Yusuke got a cool blue for Nick. At the end of the day though, despite all these additions and alterations, it is still basically good old solid Left 4 Dead 2 at its core. Stick with your team, kill zombies, and survive to the next safe room, and plays every bit as well as its retail counterpart. 
When you successfully survive, instead of the usual results or end campaign credits screen showing statistics, you get this screen that tallies your score instead and even shows you your clear time, which is something I wish the regular Left 4 Dead 4 did, frankly. Arcade has a unique victory theme compared to the regular game. I'll be at the Left 4 Dead 1 map still play the usual Left 4 Dead 1 victory theme. I honestly don't know if this is a bug or not. Now, the score tally is what's noteworthy here, because while it's meaningless with the game in its offline state, this is what the Nessica system would have used to determine unlock progress, and this is where we finally circle back around to talking about the online functionality the game had. Unfortunately, I have no way to demonstrate any of this functionality, but I do have access to lots of screenshots and written explanations from the game's official website, accessible via the Wayback Machine and the Player Ran Japanese wiki. So at the end of a stage or campaign, your score is tallied, and this was translated into class points, and also ZG, the game's currency. Yes, that's right, Left 4 Dead had an in-game currency system. You could also simply find bags of it in normal gameplay as a reward for exploration. This would have been used between levels or campaigns to purchase cosmetics for your survivors, shown here by this screenshot of the debug mode. Skins for your weapons, pretty much all of which have been dumped from the files and ported to the workshop for normal Left 4 Dead 2, so I'm not going to cover that because there's too many. But most interestingly, you could also purchase RPG-like skills that altered gameplay. There's way more than I could or would even be interesting to translate, but thank you to the player ran at wiki for providing a list of these. They range from things like faster healing speed and effectiveness to making your molotovs burn for longer, and even allowing you to escape from special infected without any help. There's nothing super crazy in here, nothing you couldn't replicate with a server plugin on the PC version, but what turns this from interesting to kinda weird is the fact that it was also possible to directly exchange your SVP for SG directly. And remember, SVP was just purchased by putting money in the cabinet, so yes, Left 4 Dead Arcade had just straight up pay to win microtransactions. But whatever, Punchy, that's not a big deal, you're only playing co-op anyway, right? There's no competitive advantage. HA! <laughs> WRONG! Let's get back to those events, I promise, shall I? So, as I said at the start, limited time events were ran over the Nessica online service. The most common and usually available of these was, in fact, Versus Play. Versus mode was included in the arcade port, albeit not the standard Versus mode you're probably used to. It was only Versus Survival. But regardless, this does have the consequence of meaning you could absolutely pay to gain an edge against other players. And there were prizes at stake for performing well in these events too, like titles and items and so on. So, mm, overall, a bit gross, not gonna lie. But enough about the slightly gross monetization, let's get back to those co-op events. As I said, these were a lot like the mutations in the normal PC release. In fact, of the eight events that were ran, five correlated to PC mutations or game modes, basically one-to-one -one, as far as I could tell. These events were the regular survival mode, Nopotofu Tocho, translation bean poles and fatties, which was the flu season mutation, Trigger Trigger Happy was Gibfest, High Hard 8 was, well, Hard 8. The three events that don't seem to correspond to any base game mode is Grenade Festival, which gave every player an infinite grenade launcher, Molotov Festival, which gave every player infinite Molotov cocktails, although for some reason they locked the map to Swamp Fever, which seems like the second worst campaign to lock an event like that too. These are pretty simple, and I was actually surprised when researching this video that no equivalent mutation existed in the PC release, but the last two events are what I thought were the most interesting. Firstly, there was Mimic Festival, a game mode where sometimes specials disguised as the survivors would attack the player which is definitely quite unique, and there's nothing like that in retail. And the final event, billed as the highest difficulty in history, God Mode. Yes, that's right! One of these events was an entirely new difficulty mode above Expert. But sadly, with the Nessica servers discontinued, there's no longer any way to play any of these unique game modes offline. Or so I thought. Because it turns out that in the operator menu for the cabinet, many of these events can be still be enabled for in-store play, including this God difficulty. Mimic Festival for some reason is not in the operator menu, which is a shame. No idea why. But unfortunately, we are so close and yet so far, because when I actually tried to boot into a game of God difficulty, the game simply informs me that it can't find a room or make one and kicks me back out to the main menu. I tried a variety of things to access this difficulty. I tried forcing it via console commands by either changing the difficulty or calling it as a mutation, but without knowing what these would have been called in the code, I was unable to get this going, which is so frustrating. It's definitely in here, and there's almost certainly a way to make it playable, but alas, while I may speak the Japanese language, I am not much for the language of computers. So here we remain, godless and sad. Seriously, if anyone figures out how to access this stuff, please let me know. I would love to play God Difficulty in a more hands-on way. In lieu of this, I was at least able to source a description of what God Difficulty entailed, again from the player ran wiki. Damage values were increased across the board, with commons now dealing a whopping 25 damage on a front hit while special and horde spore timers were decreased, resulting in more frequent attacks. Additionally, the base number of commons that can spawn in at any one time was also increased. 
It also seems that every time they ran this event with a different campaign, special infected with new properties were added, and the details on this are quite thin on the ground. I'm leaning very heavy on the promo materials here, but this poster brings claims of a new trap spitter where the length of the acid spit is increased. And this poster sports an explanation of a cannon hunter which claims it doesn't pin the survivor, but jumps at them and pushes them away. And also the reverse charger with absolutely no explanation as to what that means. I was also able to find mention on a blog post of a shield boomer which had severely increased health. On July 26, 2017, Left 4 Dead Saison Shatachi's online support was officially closed down, rendering all of this online functionality inaccessible today after roughly three years in live support, which I'm honestly not sure if that's good innings or not for a Japanese arcade game. It'd be okay if not spectacular for a modern live service title, sure, but that's also about how long the Theatre of the Marquee game lasted too, and that seemed pretty popular at the time. Oh, what's that? Uh, story for another time, maybe. I actually went about reading some Japanese player impressions via just people's personal blog posts, and the hardcore Japanese gaming audience had much the same reaction to it that I imagined the West would have. Why would I pay money to play this in the arcade when I could play it at home on my computer for way less? Remember, Seizon Shatachi released five years after Left 4 Dead 2 did, and Left 4 Dead 2 was an incredible success. It was not an unknown quantity to Japanese gamers, even if the PC and Xbox were not the dominant forms of gaming in the region when it came out. By the time Seizon Shatachi actually launched, things were starting to shift in the region. Even the Japanese wiki that I've been sourcing a lot of my info from isn't super well fleshed out, indicating that the game wasn't exactly garnering a lot of devoted players. Nevertheless, the game still definitely had players in the arcade. As a final gesture towards its player base, when the servers were shut down, the developers released some final rankings on their blog, and the results are absolutely dominated by this player, going by the handle Tami Star Emoji Haruka is my wife, who killed over a million zombies over the game's three-year lifespan, which is absolutely crazy. Waifu power fueled this individual, I'm sure. I respect it, but I also fear it. And that concludes an overly complicated look into a weird part of Left 4 Dead's history as an outstanding and influential PC shooter and its foray into the Japanese arcade market. Hopefully you learned something, and if you know anything interesting about this port as well, please let me know in a comment, because pretty much all the research I did for this video was original. This game is extremely poorly documented in English after all, I spent hours just kind of reading blog posts and official materials and stuff for this video. If you enjoyed, please leave a like, consider subscribing, and checking out my Patreon link is in the description, because it is the only thing that justifies me spending this long on videos on deeply niche topics like this. And above all else, thank you for watching.